It is good to see each and every one of you here today. This has been a fantastic week. Let me see if I I get playing the guitar back there and get all excited. I could speed that song up twice as fast as it needs to go, but boy, just hearing uh, people of God sing, lifting your voices, you know, hallelujah. No matter where you go, if you go to Africa, hallelujah, it's the same word. I invite you to take your Bibles. We're going to go to 1 Timothy. Uh, We're in chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 12 through 17. And uh, so today, we are going to finish what we began last Sunday, praising God for the exceeding glory of His grace. This morning, we want to just look into God's Word. And we've established over the last couple of weeks that God's purpose for the law is to condemn us. It's to give us Really, it's an eternal death sentence that no one here, no one here is worthy of God's grace. No one here, including yours truly, no one here is deserving of God's grace. That's why it's it's exceeding, all right? It's far beyond what we can adequately sing of and tell of. It is the exceeding glory of his grace. So the, the law of God, it restrains evil, it condemns the sinner, and then enter into our misery and plight, the gospel that Jesus has come, that he died so that we could be forgiven. First Timothy, you follow along there in your Bibles. Let's read verses 12 through 17, and we're going to look this morning at the six incredible realities about the grace of God revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ. First Timothy 1, and verse 12, and Paul writes, he says, I thank Christ Jesus the Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief or I am foremost. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first as a prime example Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And then Paul, be, he, he ends in a doxology. Now to the king eternal, immortal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Paul could not help but sharing his testimony and just ending in, do you know my king? Do you know who this king is? So as we began last week, and some of these things will come up to be helpful. Some of the scriptures will come up on the screen beside me just to keep us uh, moving together this morning and to keep before you uh, where we've been. Last week, we saw the first characteristic that comes out of verse 12 the, of the six incredible realities about the grace of God is that it's God's grace that enables men for faithful ministry. So the only reason that you have a man before you and really men before you in ministry is because of the grace of God. It is not for our own good. It's not anything of praise to our name. Uh, Someone said last night, oh, you were awesome. No, God is awesome, right? And they meant well. I, I I don't take that for that. I know what they were saying, just the message being shared. But it's God's grace. We are all to reflect. Did you see the moon last night? The ball of dirt that simply reflects the sun. I mean, that's us. Look around. We're a, bu- we're a ball of dirt, right? We're just clay. We're jars of clay. And what are we to do? Reflect the glory of God. That if, we, if, if there's anything brilliant about us, it should be that people see Christ in us and we are a reflection of his grace. Secondly, we see God's grace reaches the most unlikely. And so you might be here this morning. You say, yeah, but, yeah, but pastor, you don't know me and you don't know what I've done. Yeah, look at Paul. He gives his own vice list, and we saw it last Sunday. He said, I was a blasphemer. You have to notice the tense. I I was a persecutor. I was an insolent man. I was was hateful toward God. I was hateful toward people. And he's saying, as an angry, violent man, I was hateful toward myself. Listen, it's it's an unbelievable reality in our world that, that there are many, many of our teenagers and our young people are doing horrible things to their bodies to, you know, to try to experience feeling, to try to feel alive because they, they feel guilty. There's just so much brokenness. And Paul said, that was me. I was broken. I was, I was a danger to my own life. I was an insolent man. I was an angry man. But all God's mercy and grace was lavished on me 
So as we ended our sermon last week with Hebrews 3.15, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Let us learn from those in the Old Testament. Let us not be rebellious. It is so easy for us to be stiff-necked, isn't it? It is so easy for us to be stubborn. To just, no, you know, my dog, he's an epitome of stubbornness. You try to walk him, if Lola takes him for a walk, he knows how to hunker down and just do the brakes, and he'll, he'll, the collar will come off him before he'll move. He's just stubborn. That's not how we should be with the Lord. That's a funny analogy, but not so when it's spiritual. And we just, no, I'll keep my opinion, and I will not bow, and I will not bend my knee before the Lord Jesus. Number three, we see that God's grace is greater than all our sin. And we've sung of that this morning. The grace of God, we see in verse 14, and Paul says, oh, this grace, let me tell you about the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love. And where is that from? It's in Christ. You find that in Christ Jesus. Paul's here writing, he talks about God's grace that abounds for salvation in Christ Jesus. And you've known, and it's gonna come up on the screen, grace. What is grace? How do we understand God's grace? grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. It's, it's the riches of God, but they don't come cheap. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. That's how we have grace. I, I can't give to you a message because I bought it. I can't give to you a message because I earned it. We are all in desperate need of God's grace. And someone had to pay the fine. Someone had to pay the penalty that your sin and my sin demands. All right? We understand this in a court of law. If someone is guilty, the judge cannot let them go free without the fine, without the penalty being paid, or else he's not a good judge. Well, God cannot pardon us without someone paying the fine. And that someone is Jesus. He is God in flesh. Paul uses this word only one time in this passage, the word grace, but that word characterizes the whole passage. It's all about God's grace. The God's grace, it has and it is a distinctive characteristic of, of true Christianity. The result of God's grace is always transforming. It always transforms lives that result in, in good works. So some people are confused about, well, do I earn salvation? I have to do good works. I have to pray. I've got to fast. I've got to do all these things. I've got to be a member of a church. I've got to be baptized. I have to earn God. No, you can't. But if you come to know Christ, then it results in a transformed life where you want to serve. And let me just say, oh, the service of the body of Christ this past week. You, I, I, I stood kind of behind the scenes this year and just watch people serve. Well, where does that come from? A group of people who are trying to earn salvation? No, a group of people who have been saved and they want to pour out their lives in worship to the Lord and they serve the least of these. And they chase some of them around. Some of our teenagers chase some runners. We had some runners this week, you know. Like, hey, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where did she go? Oh, we got to find them. They're just always running. Find them, bring them back. The lost sheep. I mean, that could be a great message for Bible school. Got to go find them. We need more fences around the property. They'll probably get through those before we would. But you know the scripture, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. How are we saved? Paul writes, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a what? It's a gift. A gift from who? From God. And he says it again in verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And don't you know we would boast if it was of works? How many times did you pray this week? Well, I prayed 10 times, 12, 12. And then somebody beside me, 13. Oh, man. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. It's not ourselves, it is a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. We would. So then what happens? Well, look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. That is, in the Greek, that's a masterpiece talking about believers, those who have come by faith and trusted the Lord Jesus. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Child of God, if you know Christ, if you have repented and placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you and I are to walk in good works. That's what we have been saved for. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We have been saved from the, the power of sin. But we have been saved for a reason, and that is for good works. And if anything good happens in 
and, and through my life, as a result of my life, the, all the praise, all the glory belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to me and not to you. Paul writes to Titus, a young, younger pastor serving in Crete, Titus 3. Listen to how he says this. He says in verse 3, for we ourselves were also once foolish. You know, what? aren't you thankful that Paul said that? That was, that was us. I'm, I'm part of that. We were in that number. We were foolish, we were disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Listen, in a room this size, tent this size, there are some, and that's your testimony. That's not we were, that is you are. This is you. This is how you live. And by the grace of God, may your eyes be open and you see your sin the way God sees your sin, that you are deceived. And look at this. Verse 4, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So what do we do with all that? This is a faithful saying. You hear that? He wrote that to Timothy. You can trust in this. And these things I want you, Titus, to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain what? You see, it always goes together. If you have been saved by grace, then you will walk holding careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. If we have been redeemed, we are going to be profitable to this community. We're going to be a blessing to Richmond. We're going to be a blessing to New Haven and Chesterfield and Marysville and on out wherever you came from today. We are going to make a difference for the glory of God. If we just have us four no more bar the door, we're worthless and we're actually a bad name against the name of Christ. If we ever get this thing upside down and think this church is here to serve me, woe is me for I am undone. That's not what we're here for. We're here for the glory of Christ, and we will make a difference in our community. You know this hymn, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Listen to, I want to I hear these words said, all right? When our kids were at worship camp down at uh, Cedarville, they, they made them read the lyrics of songs to not just go into the music, but actually think about what it is that you're saying, the worship that you're offering to the Lord. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder, there's a word you use often. I, um, all right, my wife's from Kentucky. We can use that word. Yonder, on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Remember what John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. If you're here without Christ, it's pointing you to the cross. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. Okay, you can join 50 churches. You can be baptized 100 times and you cannot hide this stain. There's no detergent powerful enough to wash out the sin that stains our souls. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? And look, look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace. Freely bestowed on who? Yeah, all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Do you know the chorus? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Isn't that amazing? You have to say that multiple times because often we have to find the balance. Sometimes the sermons that I deliver are very heavy because we live in a world where so many preachers are going with, with 
gospel light. It's not no gospel at all. It's just to pump you up and make you feel better. Not talk about your sin. But we have to talk about your sin so that you understand, but is there a cure? Yes, it's God's grace. And we can stand in that and we can proclaim that and say there's an answer, there's a cure, there's a remedy. It's Jesus. Romans 5, 20, moreover, the law entered that if the offense might abound, Paul says. But where sin abounded, do you know the rest of it? Grace did much more abound. Oh, you don't know what kind of sinner I am, pastor. Yeah, well, you know what kind of sinner I am? But let me tell you this. Paul writes it by the Holy Spirit. Whatever sin abounds in your life, there's a lot of it. God's grace abounds more. Yeah, but I'm... No, no, God's grace. Super abundant, super abounding God's grace. You see, God's grace is accompanied by faith and love. It's in Christ Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying here. These scriptures are going to come through. I want you to see this. I'm going to read them quickly. But in scripture, faith and love go hand in hand. So if I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, then how does this help you? If this morning I would have said, oh, I'm so glad that I'm saved. Praise the Lord, I have faith in Christ. And uh, it's a nice day. I'm going to go golfing. And so right about now, you're sitting here wondering, where's the guy who's supposed to open the word? Well, he loved golf more than you. That doesn't sound right. See, faith and love, service, living for Christ, they go hand in hand. So if you go, oh, I have faith, but I don't love and serve the body, you, you got two, what are you coming up with there? You've been evaluating. Listen to this, Ephesians 1.15. Paul says, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and what accompanied that? <laughs> your love for all the saints. Notice, it wasn't just the ones you get along with. No, this love is super abundant, and this love will override your ill feelings toward other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's this faith. Faith and love go hand in hand. Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love, faith and love. Colossians 1, 4, verse 4, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, oh, and what followed in tow? And of your love for all the saints. That's amazing how that goes together, isn't it? Let's go over to Thessalonica, chapter 1, verse 3. What about the saints there? Remember without, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Oh, and what comes with that? Your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Where's all this done? In the sight of God our Father. 1 Thessalonians 3, 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought to us good news of your faith. And what came with your faith? Love. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians 1, verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. And what comes with that? The love of how many? Every one. Say every one. Okay? So we cannot pick and choose who our brothers and sisters are in the body of Christ. The Lord does that. He does that. Faith and love. And if we demonstrate the love of Christ because of the faith in our hearts that he has given to us, then we will, in fact, make a difference in the world around us. So he says, your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Man, it just, it abounds. It flows over. You ever get your uh, drink filled somewhere and, you know, they fill it up and they leave about that far from the top? You're like, hey, fill that thing up, right? And, and then there's sometimes when you, you remember kids filling up at McDonald's or wherever and you, and then it overflows and you get that big top and it, you have to take it slowly and scoop off the top and some dribbles down the side. Think about the love of God. It overflows. It, the Lord isn't just, you know, skimpy. We're trying to cut back on our costs here. We're almost out. No. His grace is super abundant, and that should be evident in our lives. To, to Philemon, Paul writes in verse 5, he says, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Hey, I've heard about that, Philemon, that's great. And by the way, I'm sending Onesimus back to you. You're going to need to forgive him. I've heard about your love and your faith. Your love comes from faith. And guess what? You're about to get a test of your life. 
and you're going to demonstrate it by forgiving this one that I'm sending back to you. A true Christian is always characterized by lasting faith and by a Christ-like love for others. You remember what Jesus said, John 13, 35? By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love for who? One another, because we're in the family. It's hardest at times to love the people who are in your family because you see them all the time. You know all their weaknesses and they know all of yours. And that's where our love is to shine and to grow and to mature. So in the Apostle John, he writes about this extreme love in 1 John. Pastor Scott, he'll get to this at some point in time. Give him enough opportunities to speak. He'll get here, all right? 1 John 4, listen, 7, verse 7, beloved, let us love one another. For, the, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not what? Does not know God. Well, why not? For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world and that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to what? Love, love one another, right? Right? That's going to be a natural, if he's loved us, yes, he's loved me, he saved me, then right here I'm looking at the people that I have to, I will love. And it won't be arm twisted behind the back. It will be out of the reality of what he has done in my own life. First John 4, 19, we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, you know, may I got to say it louder? I love God. Do I have to say it a little more? I love God. Yeah. But if you hate your brother, what are you? Yeah, a really hypocritical sounding liar. No matter how loud you say it or how pharisaical you say it, we have to love our brothers and he enables us to do this. I love God and hates his brother. He is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, from the Lord Jesus, that he who loves God must what? Love his brother also, right? It's not optional. It is not optional for the child of God. Who will I love? Who will I not love? Who will I be long suffering toward and who will I not? Nope. If you've known the love of God and he has known you, then that will transform your life. Verse 15, we see the next characteristic, that this grace is not only enables men for faithful ministry, it reaches the most unlikely, it's greater than all our sin, and number four, it's available to everyone through the gospel. It's only available through the gospel. It's not available through your works, it's not available through Islam, it's not available through Buddhism, it's not available through any other way, it's available through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, hey, this is a trustworthy saying, Timothy. You can take this to the bank, all right? You can trust in this. You can put your full weight down on this saying, on this, what the Lord Jesus has given to us. It's worthy of full acceptance for all people in all places. And this is why Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 15, go into where? All the world and do what? Build houses? Give them clean water? No, that, that's helpful. But we're not done with that. Feed them meals? No, that, that's not our number one goal. Command is preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to every creature. So we're not done with our commission yet, are we? Brennan is in, in Germany now. Praise God that he was able to go. He was sick, we prayed. He was raised up. Well, what is the gospel? Paul says, who? If you just break this verse down, who is Jesus Christ? It's Christ Jesus, the promised one, the revealed one. Well, what did he do? He came. Well, where did Jesus Christ, where did he come, this promised one? He came into the world. And why? To save sinners. That's what Paul is saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. He did not come to just give us a better life, to give you your best life now. He came for our deepest need, and that is we are sinners, to deliver us from our sin. You've heard us use this before, the gospel. G, God created us, why? 
to worship him, to be with him, to glorify him, to enjoy him forever. That's why he made us. Oh, our sin did what? Separated us from a holy God, right? Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve, they sinned and plunged the human race. That's why we go to funerals. That's why we suffer is because they disobeyed God. S, sins cannot be removed or repaid by doing good deeds. And this is what separates Christianity, true Christianity from every other religion in the world. Every other system says, this burden rests on you and you have to work your way to God however you define God. Christianity says, you can't do it. You have to cry out like the thief on the cross, Lord, remember me, have mercy on me, I'm guilty, I deserve to die paying for my sin. P, paying the price for our sin. Jesus Christ came into the world, lived a sinless life. He went to the cross. He died my death. He died your death, death if you will trust in him. They took him off the cross. They buried him. And the third day, that first Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead and he ascended to the Father. That is what Christ did. He paid the price for our sin. E, everyone who repents, places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone will receive L, life that never ends. The moment that you repent and trust in Christ, he gives you all the resources. He saves you. He redeems you. The Holy Spirit is given to live in you, to do through you and in you what you can't do on your own, what I can't do on my own. That's the gospel. Have you received the gospel? Have you believed the gospel? And Paul says that this gospel is for every single sinner. And Paul says, if you line up everybody, you remember as a kid or sometimes, you know, for games, you line up everybody according to height. See, who's the tallest? Who's the shortest? And you get everybody. If if you were to line up everybody by degree of sin, Paul says, you know where I stand? At the very front of the line. Number one example, sinner, here I am. Everybody else, you got to get behind me on this one. I'm the foremost sinner. So what is he saying? If God saved and he did, Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, transformed him into Paul the apostle, the greatest enemy became the greatest missionary, then Paul is saying, if I'm at the front of this line, then there's nobody for the rest of time that can say, his grace can't reach me. His grace can't save me. I'm too far gone. No, you're not. So God's grace enables men for faithful ministry. It reaches the most unlikely. God would save him. That individual? Yeah. God's grace is greater than all our sin. And God's grace is available to everyone through the gospel. Every group of people, every person, men, women, children, no matter what your race is, no matter what your country is. And number five, God's grace is more than enough to save the worst of sinners. See, Paul builds on this. He says, I'm the worst. You cannot... You cannot outdo me, Paul is saying, in level of sin. I got you beat. I got you all beat. And the Lord saved me. Look at verse 16. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern. That's an important word there. You might underline it. To those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. You see, Paul knew the reason for his conversion. The Lord Jesus would use his testimony as an example of all mercy and long-suffering demonstrated. So this pattern, the pattern of God saving Saul of Tarsus, exists for everyone else from that moment on who would believe on Jesus Christ. And everyone who trusts in Christ Jesus alone will be given what we said there in the gospel, everlasting life. That brings us to number six. God's grace enables men for faithful ministry. God's grace reaches the most unlikely. God's grace is greater than all our sin. And God's grace is available to everyone through the gospel. God's grace is more than enough to save the worst of sinners. And lastly, God's grace compels us to worship the king. Paul closes this section. He bursts forth in praise now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's where we began this service this morning. Not to us, to your name, right? Not to us, but to his name, bring glory and honor. Paul describes why God our king is worthy of all our praise because he says he's eternal. That means he's the king of the ages. 
The age that is, the age is to come, he's the eternal king. He exists outside of time, although he acts in time. He is the same yesterday, today, and how long? Forever. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is not only eternal, Paul says, but he is immortal. That is, he is imperishable and incorruptible, unlike the things that we love and treasure. Last night, someone brought, a, brought an old, uh, what did he say, 1934, was that out, out back? Was that right? 33? I mean, just listen, you got to take care of that, right? You can't just leave that outside and come back 15 years later and say, oh, what happened to the paint job? How did it fade? No, everything that we love, even our own health, right? It fades. It dims our eyes. It's getting harder to see, right? That's the way our bodies work. That's the way our lives work. Everything that is valued, it perishes, but not this king. His kingdom isn't winding down. It's not running out of money. Economy's not bad in God's kingdom. He is immortal. He is imperishable and incorruptible. He is invisible. The only way we can know him is through his disclosure. He had to disclose himself. He had to reveal himself to us. So how has God revealed himself to us? Through creation, right? You look out, you see his creation, you see the sun, the moon, the stars. We went to Mount Kilimanjaro in Bible school. You travel, you see that, say, wow. How many have been to the Grand Canyon? How many have been there? Did you feel awesome standing at the side of that thing? You're going to stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon. I'm amazing. (laughs) And everyone around you would look at you like, his medicine just ran out. Somebody needs to (laughs) help him out. Because you're before the Grand Canyon. You don't feel large and in charge there. And then if you really want to have that proven, try walking down to the bottom and back up. Right? Oh, man. how, How much farther? Oh, you're halfway. What? Halfway, yeah, halfway down. I gotta go back up. Never mind, I got it from here. Take a picture, let's go, right? It makes you feel small because it's so big. God has disclosed himself through creation. He's revealed himself in our conscience that we know right from wrong. He's revealed himself in his word clearly, but he has most vividly revealed himself in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. And he says, to God who alone is wise, there is no other God beside him, and there is no one like him. He is wise. Ginger sings a song. It's been a while since she sung it. But uh, the, the chorus goes like this. It says, God is too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you can't see his plan, When you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. He's too good. He's too wise. If there's a lack of understanding, it's not on God's part. It's on mine. I can't explain how the sun still stays right where it needs to stay and gives light and doesn't make us crispy critters or doesn't leave us freezing cold all the time. We we get cold here in Michigan, but we don't freeze up. God has placed it exactly where it needs to be. So Paul declares what, our God, what God our King is worthy of receiving. He is worthy of receiving your worship. He is re- worthy of receiving all the honor and all the glory belong to Him. And how long will our King be receiving this worship? Forever and ever. So he says, forever He will receive this worship. Now, I want to call a couple kings to the witness stand, all right? Now, I can't do it except through the word of God. But the first king is King Nebuchadnezzar. I remember learning how to spell that name, Nebuchadnezzar. Right? That's how I learned how to spell that name because it threw me off all the time as a kid. Nebuchadnezzar, after his seven years of humiliation, Daniel chapter 4, here he is. He's the king. He's large and in charge. He goes out, looks over his kingdom. I'm an amazing king. I am awesome. Look at my kingdom. And the Lord takes from him sense. And he's driven out as a beast in the field for seven years. Listen to what he comes to when God returned to him his thinking faculties. Don't take that for granted, that you can think, that you can reason, right? We know what it is to 
care for those who have Alzheimer's? Don't procrastinate. Because the day will come when you and I probably will not be able to make sense of 2 plus 2. So do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Listen to what this king writes. Nebuchadnezzar, what do you say about this king? And he says in verse 34, At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives how long? Forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he can say, let me tell you firsthand, he can put you down because he did to me and he brought me back. And I will praise and honor his name. Second king I want to bring is King Darius in Daniel chapter 6. King Darius, after God delivered Daniel from the lion's den, in verse 25, then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Why is that, King Darius? For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Wow. This king praises the king of heaven. When Daniel sees the vision of the son of man in Daniel chapter 7, and he says this, putting this all together, and even in Islam, even in Judaism, they understand the title Son of Man is a title of deity. And that was Jesus' favorite title of himself. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Listen to what Daniel says in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. He says, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion, the Son of Man, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So do you remember what Paul said in Philippians 2 when he takes the Old Testament with the New Testament and we see that Christ was promised in the Old Testament and he was fulfilled in the New Testament. He came. What does Paul say in Philippians 2 verse 5? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant of a slave. This king, the son of man, the eternal king came as a slave a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name uh, which is above every name that at the name of Jesus what will happen every knee will bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord to the glory of God the Father. This has happened in my life and this will happen for all who have ever lived. The question is not if it will happen. The question is when. When will this happen? Will this happen while you are alive and you can find and experience his grace and mercy? Or will this happen after it is too late and you recognize him at last to be the conquering king, the one who was worthy, the only one worthy of your worship and you gave it to you and to your family and to your job and you spent your worship and your glory and your honor on things you can't keep.
Oh, beloved, don't do that. God's grace is so amazing. It is so amazing. It enables men for faithful ministry. It's all God's grace. All the glory belongs to God. We'll pull up the summary here at the end. God's grace. It enables men for faithful ministry. Not only does it do that, but God's grace reaches the most unlikely. God's grace is greater than all our sin. God's grace is available to everyone through the gospel. God's grace is more than enough to save the worst of sinners. And God's grace compels us to worship the King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I want to share with you this morning the tombstone. I've talked about this before, but I found the picture. Many of us know amazing grace. Last night, the men of grace were here. They sang about God's grace. They sang a Chris Tomlin song, My Chains Are Gone. I've Been Set Free. And it's about the amazing grace of God. You know this song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. And that's easy for us to sing. I mean, a wretch like me. Wretch like who? Like John Newton, the guy who wrote it. And what he writes, this is on his tombstone. Let me encourage you. What should be said at your funeral? What should be remembered? Why not write it down? Why not put those things in order so that people know who you are and what you believe and who you're trusting and what you want the living to hear when they gather to say goodbye to your shell, your tent that you put off? Listen to what John Newton writes. This is on his tombstone. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of the slaves in Africa. You remember what he did, right? Slave trader. And he would haul steel men out of Africa and women, and he would put them in cargo holds. Many of them died in the journey across the ocean. He regarded them as cargo, no better. On his tombstone are these words, servant of the slaves in Africa, which... By, was by the, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and then what, John? Appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to, to, to destroy. I used to hate Christianity is what he's saying. This is on his tombstone. It's still etched there. You can still see it. I tried to destroy Christianity, and he reached down, and he preserved me when I should have died. He restored me. He pardoned me and appointed me to preach the faith that I long tried to destroy. Do you know this grace? Have you admitted, Lord, I am a sinner. I've told lies. I've lusted. I've done wrong. Maybe you've taken God's name in vain. You've blasphemed his name. You're guilty. Have you admitted that? God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. And turn from your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Cry out to him. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Bible says, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, here's the promise of scripture. You will be saved. And if you will not, you, you cannot be saved. You must repent and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you have not done that, I'm inviting you, do so today. Don't take today for granted. We've been given a beautiful day. We have been given a great place to come and to worship. Our community, our city, just so friendly to us to let us come. I saw one of the police officers last night. I came by just to make sure everything was still where we left it. Uh, Leonard works the midnight shifts. So I pulled up behind him, you know, and he was sitting at the car at the corner. And I said, hey, I'm Brian. I'm one of the chaplains, and we got our tent over there. And if you get a chance, maybe go by. He said, oh, sure, I'll take care of it. All right, you guys have a great day. We're not to take this for granted. We praise the Lord for this. We want to be a blessing to our community. The greatest blessing is that you can have your sins forgiven, that you can know Christ as your Savior. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? In a moment, we're going to, we're going to pray. If you're here and you say, Pastor, will you pray for me because I do not know that I'm saved. If I was to die today, I don't know where I would be. Will you pray for me? 
Would you slip your hand up? I will not embarrass you, but I will pray for you. Is there anyone like that here today? I bless you. I see your hand. Anyone else? Anybody else? You say, I, I am not ready. I am not ready for eternity. May today be the day of your salvation. Turn from your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that can take your word and apply it to our lives. I pray for those who, who do not that today would be the day of their salvation. Father, work your will in our lives, in our hearts. Thank you that you alone are the strong God, ready to save all who come to you. In the great name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.